Okay, so, uh, yeah, I'm Tom Smith, and I'm going to be talking about our qualitative study exploring gesture sonification to support reflective craft practice. Um, just as a quick overview, I would first start talking about the motivation behind the study and the study design, and then um, our, our running of the study and our findings, and finally end up with some discussion points and potential future work. So, um, we, began, we began by thinking about how we can explore craft skill. So, how do we define craft skill? We define it as the elusive knowing through which practitioners perform and develop their craft. Um, parts of this knowing um, can be articulated through speech and demonstration. So um, a lot of people learn crafts in an apprenticeship model uh, where they'll have one-on-one -on -one, um, work with a, a professional. Um, but the problem is uh, some parts are harder to articulate through speech and demonstration and have to be learned by doing. So, for example, um, learning how, what kind of pressure is required to be put on a tool to do a certain uh, technique or how much tension to hold in the material, you can't really communicate that through strict speech or demonstration, it has to be learned by doing. So, we were thinking, could these new nuances be reflected in the movements the practitioner employs? And therefore our study is about investigating how translating gestures into sound, so sonifications, could facilitate practitioners' reflection on their craft practice. So, uh, to design the study, um, we decided that we'd have three different workshops, all which build um, off each other. So after the first workshop, we'd iterate the design of the sonifications based on our findings to go into the second workshop, and then again into the third. Um, and we wanted to work with an established group of local craft practitioners of varying skill levels. Uh, that's because, because the, this research is quite exploratory, uh, we didn't want just students or just professionals, we wanted a nice mix of people. And finally, uh, we took a research through design approach. And that's because we didn't want to restrict um, our inquiry by predefining too many elements of the system. But also, we didn't want to leave it too open that we wouldn't be able to progress very far because we wouldn't have a, a definite goal. So, uh, in terms of the workshop design, um, like I said, we had three work we decided we'd have three workshops. The first one would be an open exploration um, of some initial sonifications that we created, and then a second one um, would explore um, sonifications together with the participants. And thirdly, we would take the final sonifications we had and um, see if they could be used to help learn a, a different but similar craft, and see if they, we can transfer some of the usefulness of the sonifications to a new craft. So. Uh, next, we have to decide what craft we were going to um, focus on. Uh, there's lots of different crafts, obviously, and you can categorize them different ways, but we thought of them in terms of uh, handcrafts, tool-based crafts, uh, machine-based crafts. So handcraft would be like origami or something like that. Tool-based would be things like knitting um, and machine-based like woodworking. And we decided we'd focus on textile um, tool-based crafts uh, of crochet and hooky matting. And so just in case you don't know what crochet is, it's a lot like knitting, but it just uses one needle, as you can see, which is in one hand, and then the other hand is used um, for manipulating the material. And down on the bottom right there is an example of hooky matting, uh, where, as you can see, it's similar. It uses one tool, uh, but the difference is you're pushing bits of material through a cloth to build up the work. And we decided to focus on this um, for a number of reasons. Firstly, the use of the tool is direct. Uh, if we're measuring the movements of the craft practitioner, the, the, tool, um, the way the tool is manipulated is very direct to how the artifact is produced. Uh, secondly, there's a lot of repeated gestures, a lot of stitches that are done over and over, so this lends itself well to sonifications. Um, and thirdly, uh, one of our researchers is a crocheter themselves, so there was a familiarity with the craft which helped us design and test. Um, so this is what we ended up with. This is a, a crochet hook, and the white bit you can see on the end, that's a 3D printed case, which inside has a wireless accelerometer, a wax. Um, and that's, there's a couple of reasons why we chose that technology. Uh, firstly, it's very small and light, so it doesn't get in the way of the use of, um, of crocheting. Uh, secondly, it's wireless, so again, there's not a wire having to be connected to a computer um, to transfer the data, so uh, again, it means that it doesn't um, obstruct the user. Um, and thirdly, we did also look at maybe using vision-based systems, but the material and the tools can occlude different parts of it, so it just seemed like the most practical to use. 
So now that we had our um, system, we needed to work on some sonifications that we were going to use in the first workshop. And we decided, because we weren't sure what was going to be useful or what wasn't, uh, we would create three sonifications that were very differently designed. So firstly, um, oh sorry, before that, firstly, we decided that we would quantify the data to try and decide if um, uh, what was important for efficient crocheting. So through discussing it with other crocheters, uh, we decided on two things, which is the smoothness of movement and the consistent rate of movement. So using the raw data coming from the accelerometer and gyroscope, uh, we performed some smoothing functions um, to see the difference in smoothness of different people's crocheting. Uh, performed fast forward transform as well to see how much uh, high frequencies are in the data, so we know if there's a lot of sporadic movement. Um, and also second order derivative to see where big changes were. And then we, could, then we came up with quite a simple rating, a crocheting rating, uh, that we could apply to some sonifications. So like I was saying just before, we created three different sonifications. Uh, one was very simple, uh, which is just called coaching, which basically made a beep sound when a crochet's score dropped below a threshold, uh, just to remind, just to tell them that they were uh, not going as smoothly as they previously were. Uh, wind, which used natural sounds, and a higher rating produced calm bird song and quiet wind sounds, and a lower rating produced loud wind and thunderstorm sounds, like in a spectrum. And thirdly, build up, which was a repeating melody, uh, and if you kept above a uh, threshold, for a certain amount of time, uh, more instruments came into the melody, and so on. So you, so you got a richer sound, the better you were doing, that's the idea. So this is a shot of our first workshop. So there's myself and one of the other researchers to the right of me, and then five participants. Uh, the woman in front left is using our augmented crochet hook, while the others are just doing their normal crocheting. And um, over the course of three hours, they took it in turns to try the different sonifications uh, while we had discussions about crocheting, craft practice in general, and also their thoughts on the sonifications. Um, the, findings from the, main, the main findings from this workshop uh, as follows. Um, in terms of the aesthetics of the sonifications, uh, build-up was preferred for its musical qualities, whereas wind was, wasn't liked. Uh, it seems to be due to its natural sounds, is what the participants said. Um, so that kind of told us what we should do to iterate in the future and not use these kind of natural sounds. Secondly, in terms of design the sonifications, build up again was preferred to coaching, and as one participant said, uh, I felt like it was, I was guiding it, whereas coaching was guiding me. Uh, the fact that coaching was kind of imposing itself on her crocheting was actually not useful. It was more stressful than build up. But the most important thing that we saw, the most interesting, was the most experienced crocheter, uh, she described her movements herself as jerky and aggressive, and that's actually how our system picked it up. Um, she was extremely fast at crocheting, which meant that our system thought that she was being very sporadic and didn't have this smooth movement. And so she actually sometimes got a worse rating than the, the less experienced crocheters. Um, but what was really interesting is that the other partici participants tried to emulate the shat sound she was producing rather than trying to get the best sound. So even though they were told bird songs better than thunderstorm, after she got the thunderstorms, they were trying to get the thunderstorms. So that actually made us think about, okay, how are we going to design this, the sonifications for the next uh, workshop? And so we threw out the rating system, basically, and decide for inferring meaning. So rather than trying to embed meaning into the sonifications, uh, based on that finding, we decided that we'd make ambiguous and abstract sonifications so they could infer their own meaning based on their own social context as a crocheting group. And so we called these descriptive sonifications, and um, these were designed much differently. So we, d we mainly just smoothed the accelerometer and gyroscope data, and they just fed into amplitude modulation and frequency modulation sonifications. Um, and actually, the first thing that we realized was it was, very, it was very easy to hear regular patterns of movement, so to hear the stitches. Um, and finally, for this second workshop, as I said, because it was about uh, working with the participants, uh, we created a simple interface so that they could try and have a go at personalizing some of the sonifications um, this is just a shot of a PD patch, and so the idea is that they can move the sliders to work out how much, uh, to, to, to change how much of the different properties were part of the sound. So then running workshop two, um, on the left again there's one of the participants using our crochet needle, and on the right is one of the participants working with me um, to, to manipulate the sound. As you can see just in the background, um, one of the as one of the participants was um, crocheting. 
And this, uh, this workshop had four participants, and uh, we were split up into three sections. We started off by talking about the new sonifications and comparing them to the previous workshop, then um, using them, and then ending with a discussion uh, again around the sonifications. And our main findings from this, uh, an interesting one was hearing the stitches. So the two most uh, experienced crocheters said they could hear differences in stitches when listening to other participants crochet. Uh, one participant described it as getting a mental reward when they realized when they heard that they were getting a nice sound. Um, secondly, um, an interesting one was noticing differences in technique. And this was the main takeaway that we got from this workshop, was that one of the participants, Margaret, um, her sound patterns were different to the others. And to start off with, they, they weren't sure why. And so they went back and forth, each of them trying it again. And this was, wasn't prompted by us at all. They just went off and did this themselves. And they came to the conclusion that Margaret manipulated the material in a different way to the others. And they, they've been crocheting for years together and hadn't realized that they've actually got these different techniques. And so then through the rest of the workshop, Margaret taught one of the other um, participants, Shelley, um, her technique, causing Shelley to describe her own technique as uneconomically inefficient. And she was now going to try and learn the way that Margaret did it. So we actually saw that these sonifica sonifications did have a benefit to the um, participants in this way. Um, the last thing was, in terms of learning techniques, um, we talked about the ways that they'd learned um, how to crochet before, um, because we were thinking about workshop three, and uh, some of them learned using uh, YouTube videos, so we wondered if we could like, create our own mock YouTube videos with the sonifications on it as well. And um, another thing that happened in terms of learning was some of the participants kind of subconsciously followed the, s the sound of the others and ended up crocheting, like kind of wrong for their crocheting. So they had to stop because they were just following it by accident. Um, so we thought they were quite interesting and if we could make some applications based off that. So in terms of designing the third workshop, we decided we'd continue using these, <coughs> these descriptive sonifications because of how well they worked in workshop two. And we also created two exercises a stitch along exercise which was based on that kind of subconscious uh, entrainment where um, our, one of the researchers crocheted with doing different stitches and we recorded it using our sonification system that we were then going to present to the participants and secondly we made our YouTube style kind of teaching video which also had the sonification sound embedded in it um, as like another mode of to help learning uh, so here's some images from workshop 3 on the left is a proggy um, hook with our, our augmented, but augmented with our motion sensor. On the right is a hooky, a hooky needle, again with the um, accelerometer attached to the top. Um, okay, and in terms of findings, in terms of the stitch along exercise, the most experienced crochets said they could hear the different stitches, but the least couldn't. So, we're not, so it was useful to some, but not as a learning tool. Uh, but secondly, the video exercise um, was described as a, a useful as another mode of support. So. Um, one of the participants said that um, she only gl had to glance up at the video because she could actually just follow along with the sound and only glance up every so often just to make sure she was in the right place. Uh, and also using the sonifications with the new craft, the hooky matting, um, it was used in different ways. Some used it as positive reinforcement, while others used it to discern when they were making errors. Um, but, they did, but they all said there was a big link between the action and sound. When we took away the sound, one of them even just stopped and didn't know why. Uh, because they needed the, the sound was part of the experience of learning the craft. Um, I'll just really quickly add, finish with some discussion points. So there's a few more in the paper, but so we've kind of shown that um, enabling interpretive flexibility by um, by directly linking gestural data to the sonifications rather than trying to embed meaning was the most useful to, uh, for the participants. Um, secondly. Um, the participants were able to perceive differences, and this actually helped understand um, the different, their different techniques and actually helped them discuss techniques in a way they haven't before. And supporting reflection upon and development of collective practice, uh, the direct sonification of gestures enabled participants to perceive the nuances uh, more readily, and this supported the group's learning by doing through heightening their sensitivities uh, to the patterns of gestures. Um, future work. Obviously, we've only got a small number of participants and one craft, so it'd be interesting to see if any of this translates to others. Uh, secondly, because uh, we can show that it does help in discussion, reflection, learning in a way, uh, could this translate to remote and en masse learning, uh, which you know an apprenticeship model usually can't because you've only got two or three people. And finally, um, oh, um, could, we, could this be a way to preserve craft skills? There's a lot of heritage craft skills that are disappearing because they're only tied to a local community. 
could this be a way that, uh, or an interesting thing that we might take forward is, could this be a way to helping preserve them in some way? So, thank you. Any questions? So that's one of the reasons, kind of, because it's such a like early piece of work, and that's that's one of the reasons why we kind of used, uh, we decided on a, like tool-based uh, textile crafts, is because we could focus it much more on the tool. But um, yeah, depending on the craft, pressure might be a problem. Or we also thought about in, in the future maybe not just having one accelerometer, but a couple of others. So one on the other hand that's doing the tension in the material, or maybe also on the wrists as well. And yeah, but that's definitely a potential problem. Yes, exactly. exactly. Yes. Okay, any final questions? Any questions? Mm -hmm. yeah, please run up to the mic. <coughs> run, run. <coughs> okay, Nadia um, Bertus from UCL. Uh, very interesting. I was, I'm using sound also for signification of body movement, if you're not a craft in my case. But I was interested to know if, begin, if you have tried with a uh, beginner and if uh, by hearing the sound they felt uh, they were doing more, I don't know, as a way of, and with um, expert, uh, I was wondering, given that they feel the stitches, and if you augment in terms of, use more uh, um, type of sensor, I don't know, even gyro, if they could use it to understand where they are in a very complex pattern, and I don't know right, if they talk it. about that. Um, yeah, we, we did a bit of work with a complete beginner. So we um, tested them. Uh, basically, we had an experienced crocheter, and they sat next to, watched them use the system and hear the sound, and then tried it themselves to hear the sound. Uh, but we just didn't really do enough of that to work it into this work. But, um, but they, were, they were said that they were extremely skeptical when they first started trying it. But then what they did, they just tried, they memorized and then even vocalized the noise pattern, the sound pattern of the expert, and then was kind of like humming it along in their head with what they were doing to try and make it, to try and match it, and actually said it was a help. Um, so that's a, also a possible thing for the future is to look into that. And in terms of experts, we haven't really, we deliberately didn't focus on experts because we were seeing how it would work for reflection and kind of potential learning, uh, but that's definitely something that, that would be interesting. Yeah.